You are now listening to the Griot's Black Podcast Network, Black Culture Amplified. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Writing Black. This is Maisha and I am really, this is a treat today for me because I have on not only one of my favorite writers, but one of my favorite people who I also happen to be related to. That's a full disclosure journalist thing I got to do. This is Keith Boykin, y'all, who uh, a lot of you may know as a popular, uh, you know, political pundit on some of your favorite networks. Um, and he's also a best-selling author who's written, I think, are we on book? We've, we've done book four already, Keith, correct? Are we working on like five, five and now. six now? Five, five books, books now. Okay, yeah. see, I can't even keep track. This right. is what happens when you have a very prolific person in your life and we are not play cousins we're actually related <laughs> and he uh blessed us by agreeing to come on to writing black and talk about his own writing journey and i'm so happy to have you here thank you keith hi how are you honey hey Maisha. <laughs> i'm doing really well happy to be able to join you on this call and for the podcast and just to be able to talk with you about writing it's always a pleasure um you know listen in addition to being one of my favorite cousins you uh you are, you've been very prolific and you have been a groundbreaker, I think in so many aspects. I mean, you were the first openly gay member of a presidential administration that I know of. You were in Clinton's administration. You also worked on the Dukakis campaign. Um, your reach uh, in the political sphere is far and wide. And yet you've also, I think, made such an, an indelible impact in terms of writing on LGBTQIA plus issues. I think well before that was like a, a, a part of like popular lexicon, you know, before a lot of pe other people were considering that. And I, I think when we talk about bringing your whole self to work or bring your whole self to your writing, to me, you've always been really exemplary in that respect. So A, I want to give you kudos on that, but I also want to talk about what that journey has been like for you, because I think you've been at it longer than most of the authors that we talk to, the, the writers, the poets, the screenplay writers. Most of the people you talk to on this podcast have not been at it as long as you. And I think that um, that pioneering spirit is something I really want to delve into. So how did that, how did that happen for you? Well, I'm tempted to say it runs in the family. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it does. Because <laughs> I mean, I mean, I think about all the things you've done, not just as a writer, but as an editor, as a model, as a singer, a Grammy-nominated singer at that. Well, I mean, you know, I get it from my mama, so there's that. I, exactly, exactly. <laughs> I, I think the first time I ever remember seeing your mom, actually, was a child, was when she was on her way to uh, in, in Houston to host a, 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 a TV news broadcast, and she was anchor of... Uh, and so, you know, it's like this, <laughs> you, you, you come from a proud tradition, as do I. Um, and it's just, I think it's just, it's just something that's always been ingrained in me that um, you share your story, you, you use your talents, that you, you help in whatever way you can. And so many of us have these uh, skills and talents that we don't get a chance to utilize because of the lives that we have or the work that we do. Uh, and so it's, I'm very fortunate to be able to, to be a writer, uh, to be able to spend time to write. Because, you know, it takes time to write a book. It takes uh, yeah. time out of your life. <laughs> yeah. You know? It really does. And, you know, listen, I think um, for people who aren't familiar, you know, listen, you have – one of the things I, I actually really love about your, your writing career, I mean, you've kind of worked in several different mediums of writing. I mean, I remember – you know, for instance, going to a dramatic interpretation of, and this had to be, I'm going to say, gosh, your third or, so this maybe was your fourth book, which was for colored boys who have considered suicide, oh, you know, right, right, and, right. and that was when we were both living in New York, um, you know, Beyond the Down Low was a bestseller. That was a huge thing. And, and, you know, you, as somebody who's so politically, uh, you know, astute, you really have leaned into the personal. I think a lot of um, people in that sphere are really afraid to do that because of, I guess, how to be interpreted, whatever. And I think like you were probably one of the people from me who taught me that the personal is political to, in a certain respect, right? Like who we are and who we bring to the table and how 
we make political decisions, who we ask to represent us, et cetera, is incredibly important. Um, and I don't know that we get to do that if we don't express fully who we are. Um, so, you know, I, I definitely, you know, your early books weren't really political, even though you had this, well, I mean, to me, they weren't overtly political, but like, even though you have, as a professional, really leaned towards politics, your books have really leaned into this like deeply, deeply personal aspect of your life and the lives of so many black people and brown people in America. Um, what have you wanted people to take from that? Well, I think you are, you've hit the nail on the head because it's really important for me at least to be able to bring all of different parts of my identity to the table. Um, and as a political person, um, as a black person, as a gay man, uh, as an American, you know, so many different identities that I bring into any conversation. And I've never felt like there's any one space where I'm fully represented. So I've always felt like an, out, an outsider uh, in every space. Um, and, and part of that is kind of what I try to sort of bring to my stories. I mean, I, I, mean, I worked in the White House, but I've, I've been involved in politics my entire life, but I've never been as political as the political people around me. I mean, the people who just talk nonstop politics, I, it's never been me. I mean, I like to relax by not talking about politics. But And one of the reasons why I left Washington, D.C. years ago is because everybody would always come up to me in bars and, and restaurants and start talking about politics. I was like, oh, my God, get a life, people. <laughs> um, and I, I just kind of feel like I like to sort of be able to be all the bring all the different dimensions of myself to, to my writing and to, uh, to my stories. I find that kind of difficult in some, some ways, too, especially... Uh, for example, with the compartmentalization in social media. So, for example, I think I may have mentioned to you this to you before. Uh, whenever I'm on Twitter, it seems like people only want me to talk about politics mm -hmm. um, or race in politics, but usually politics. Um, and if I'm on Instagram, people only want to see pictures or you know videos. And they don't really care as much about politics. They just sort of want to see you know who, what I'm doing. Um, and I feel like I, I can't really figure out all, a way to sort of integrate all those different things so people can see me in all the different ways I am. Um, so if I post a, a photograph of myself, just a regular photograph of myself on, on, on Twitter, nobody cares. Nobody would even post or respond or anything. But if I post something about Donald Trump, then I get, you know, hundreds or thousands of people responding. So... You know, it's this, it's this difficult thing about, like, not allowing people to put you into boxes. And I think that's what I try to do in my writing, just sort of show up as who I am um, as a political person, as a black person, as a gay man, as a human being, as an American, just so many different interests to who I am um, and layers. And, and none of us come into any conversation just one dimensionally. No, definitely. I mean, listen, agreed. And I struggle with that, too, <laughs> actually. You know, I've been teasing you for years, you know, so if those of you who actually follow Keith on Instagram will know what I'm talking about. Keith yeah. is like my favorite shirtless political pundit. <laughs> I'm like, I've seen yeah. my cousin shirtless like more than <laughs> more than publicly. I'm not sure if I, I've seen my own boyfriend as shirtless as I've seen oh. you. But, <laughs> but I love that. And I love, you know, again, because it's like there's a humanizing aspect to that. And I think we don't always get that in our political dis discourse. We don't always get that in our, uh, like, you know, I think it's very easy to flatten people period, in uh, social media discourse, in political discourse, et cetera. And I think that you've constantly demanded to be seen holistically. I, I, you know, I remember years ago, people, you know, listen, you have to be of a certain age to remember this, but I remember, you know, Keith, you, you ran for, uh, you were on, I think it was Showtime, the candidate. Oh, yeah. It yeah. shocked me at the end when they were asked to vote on me that 23 of them in the focus group raised their hand and said they liked me. It totally confused me. Yeah. <laughs> well, you really were able to kind of bring these, you know, disparate, right. well, I won't even say disparate, but just these, you know, varied identities to task in, in one forum. Um, I want to talk a little bit about craft, though. Did you get any kind of, like, pushback, um, you know, from potential publishers, agents, et cetera, when you were like, yeah, I don't really want to, like, talk about politics all the time. Like, I want to... <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, mm. talk about other stuff. Well, you know, it's interesting because I, I, 
I've gotten pushback from people, but not from publishers about that. I think publishers have put me into sort of a race and sexuality box mm. for years. Uh, and so the last book I wrote, Race Against Time, yes. The yes. Politics of a Darkening America, was the first book that didn't deal with sexual orientation really at all. I mean, it, there was an element of it, but it was 99% of it was not about that. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people didn't know exactly how to receive that, you know, like um, it was different for me to, to do that. From 1865 to 1964, the racist Democratic Party of the 19th century slowly evolved into the party of civil rights, while Lincoln's Republican Party very gradually began to transition into the party against those rights. Uh, but the, one of the dangers I was afraid of from the beginning when I started writing was that I would be pigeonholed as just sort of a black gay writer, or just only writing about black LGBTQIA issues. And that's something I was interested in, but it wasn't the only thing I was interested in because I'd also worked in politics. I've, I've, been, I've been a lawyer, or I've been a teacher, a professor, and uh, you know, I have a lot of different backgrounds and interests. Uh, but sometimes it's hard for that to show up in the publishing world. I also remember an instance when my third book was published, uh, uh, Beyond the Download. It was a picture of me, speaking of what you were saying, it was a picture of me on the cover of the book in a, um, uh, a black t-shirt. And I liked the picture. I thought it was kind of a cool, cool picture. But one of my colleagues uh, called me up after, the, after he received a copy of the book and said, um, I have a question. Are you selling books or beefcake here? <laughs> Why can't I and be I both? I was thinking, exactly. <laughs> that's exactly what I was thinking. I, was like, I don't care why people buy the book as long as they buy the book, you know. So, <laughs> well, uh, but hopefully they'll read it once they get I'm it. I'm happy so. to say my copy is signed. My copy is signed. Okay. <laughs> I'm also in the liner notes of Race Against Time, so I feel special. Y'all, we're going to take a break, but stay tuned for more Writing Black. Introducing Dear Culture with Panama Jackson on the Griot Black Podcast Network. Bring your friends for the shenanigans and stay for the edutainment as Panama debates culture wars, Janet Jackson versus Michael, Black Fashions, Black Mendations, and everything black. Listen today on the Griot mobile app for all the black culture conversations you don't want to miss. Also available wherever great podcasts are heard. Welcome back to Writing Black, y'all. And clearly took us on, I mean, you really took us through a civics lesson and a journey in terms of how we got here, why we're here, who wants us here, and what, how it serves them, and what we personally should be doing to get ourselves out of here, right? Um, and... Um, I do hope people engage with that book because I think it's really, you made it very digestible and you made it, um, uh, these are some fundamental truths that we're living with right now. And I think like even since you've published it, we've seen even more of what you were already discussing um, unfold. But, you know, I, I think to myself with that, like, do you think, do you think people have a hard time in terms of like, who was the messenger of that? Like, who's the right person to deliver that information? I feel like there's so many people and we're all kind of like screaming into the void saying, hey, 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 <laughs> you know. Is right. there a right person to deliver that information? Is there a right person? I mean, I, can't, I don't know anybody who's more politically astute than you. Like, personally, I don't know that person. Um, but what is it about that message that people are having such a hard time processing, I guess? Well, you know, there's that old saying, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. And I feel like there's lots of teachers out there. It's just a question of whether America, the student, is willing to listen. And the reality is that most of us who are in the African-American community have been teachers on this for a long time. We've been warning about what's happening in our country for years. We've been warning about the dangers of Trump. We've been warning about the backlash against uh, Barack Obama. We've been warning about the rise in racism and white supremacy and anti-blackness. But a lot of those warnings were dismissed. I remember literally being on CNN a few years ago when Donald Trump was president and making some statement about after Trump had retweeted something about uh, uh, some people who were endorsing a civil war or whatever. And I mentioned that as I was saying that the president of the United States should not be essentially endorsing the idea of civil war. And the people who were on the panel 
just kind of dismissed me like I was crazy for even saying this. And and we're you know, black people. I think we've always been the canary in the coal mm-hmm. mine. We've always been the ones to sort of warn America about the dangers. And I think black people can see very clearly where our country is headed right now. And I think a lot of people aren't really stepping up to the to the plate. So I don't necessarily know that I have to be the messenger or that it could ever be a sole messenger. I think there are lots of messengers out there who can communicate that message. And so there's a lot of people who are writing books now and talking about these things. Um, and some of my favorite books are books that I've quoted in, in my, my most recent book, you know, Ibram X. Kendi's book, Stamped yeah. from the Beginning, or How to Be an Anti-Racist, mm-hmm. you know, um, books like The New Jim Crow or, or The 1619 mm-hmm. Project, books that are really delving into not only uh, who we are as a nation, but how we got here as a country. And I, I think the, the knowledge has always been there, but we haven't always been willing to acknowledge it and, and admit it. Not we, you and I, but we meaning America's the largest Listen, society. maybe me too sometimes. I think it's really hard. It's a hard reality to sit with. I think that, you know, I mean, listen, I always call this a writing podcast and not a political podcast, but the personal is political. And I think of anybody that I know you have helped me reconcile that, right? Like that it is. this Who we are and how we exist in the world is political. And there are people who will cease to deny that. And some people have the luxury of denying that. But I can't, you know. <laughs> like, you can't, <laughs> you know. So, um, yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree with you. And I think, you know, yeah, you're right. There is no perfect messenger for that. Y'all, we're going to take a break, but stay tuned for more Writing Black. Introducing Dear Culture with Panama Jackson on the Grio Black Podcast Network. Bring your friends for the shenanigans and stay for the edutainment as Panama debates culture wars, Janet Jackson versus Michael, Black Fashions, Black Mendations, and everything Black. Listen today on the Grio mobile app for all the Black culture conversations you don't want to miss. Also available wherever great podcasts are heard. Welcome back to Writing Black, y'all. I want to hear about your upcoming books. I do. I want to, what, I know you guys, you have stuff well, you coming know, out. It, it's funny you say <laughs> that because I was just about to segue into that when you mentioned Come the personal is political. <laughs> yes. Because I think I'm working on four, four different book projects. Four? Right you now. told me too. <laughs> yeah, but. You're so busy. Okay. Okay, I'm, I'm using the word working a little yes. loosely okay. when I say that. <laughs> okay. I have developed four different book proposals. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're in different stages of development, put okay. it that way. Um, but there, but three of those four are all very, very uh, personal. Uh, one is um, sort of is called. I think it's tentatively called. Why does everything have to be about race? Which is um, sort of a response to all the questions and answers, and provides answers to all the debates that have been going on in mm-hmm. our country. You know. Um, not just affirmative action, but critical race theory and, and teaching black history and, and Juneteenth. Everything that's going on, people are talking about, is sort of a response that provides information to respond mm-hmm. to that. That's the least personal of those four books. Uh, and that, that one will probably come okay. out next year. Uh, but in the meantime, I just finished a book that will come out this year, uh, which will be, is my first ebook, actually. Um, and I published, I'm publishing this with Scrib. And this one's called Quitting. Why I left my job to live my life with oh, freedom. Well, that's a common. That's, uh, that's com- a very listen. personal story about being. <laughs> that's that's know, a current right? event. Exactly. Ask Beyonce. That is a current story. event. <laughs> a very... yeah, exactly. Well, I'm not telling everybody to to quit their job like Big Frida and. Uh, you know, funny you enough, know, I don't Beyonce, actually think they were at, they were telling people to quit, quit their jobs either. But that's a that's that's another story. That's another yeah. story. <laughs> I'm just I, I, but, I, but I am telling people to quit this mentality of identifying ourselves yeah. by our work, yeah. um, to, to start to live our lives, um, and, um, and to redefine the whole concept of how we work and where we work and why we work in the first place. You know, um, I mentioned in the book a story about visiting Spain when I was in college and um, going, watching the siesta hour you know, in, 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 in the afternoon every day in Granada, Spain. Um, when I was a foreign, foreign exchange student, and thinking, why do they take two hours out of the day every day just to, to do nothing? It doesn't make any sense to me, you know, my American capitalist thinking mentality. I'm like, this is so inefficient. 
Uh, and I remember asking a bartender in uh, a local bar once about this in Granada. He said to me, well, you know, Americans, you live, you work to live. Excuse me, you live to work. Sorry. And, and in Spain, we work mm -hmm. to live. So, um, you know, I, it occurred to me then, oh, yeah, we do focus our lives around work in America. And that shouldn't necessarily be the way things are. So anyway, that is a very personal book. Um, and then the other two books that are in earlier stages of development, one I think you may know about, which is, well, you know about both stories, but one is about um, the search for my biological father, uh, which uh, I just sort of discovered five years ago, I guess, six years ago. Um, and what that's about, and what that says about our history as a country, about black history, about um, about how black people are still, oh, you know, it's a very political conversation, even though it's a very personal conversation, because it, to me, it's a reflection of how so much of our history has been stolen from us. Um, like most people can't trace their history in the African American community, can't trace the history back past the 20th mm -hmm. century. Um, and I couldn't trace my history past uh, a few decades before I was born. But, uh, but because I was able to do some research, I was able to go back even farther. So then the third, the last project, I guess is the fourth project, is a book about a um, person I met in Cuba six years ago. Um, it started dating. Um, and uh, we had this international relationship. Uh, and went to Cuba, went to Havana every month, and uh, wrote about it a, little, a lot on Facebook, and then I helped him to move to Chile. Um, and he was in Chile, living in Chile for several years. And then just a few months ago, he crossed the border into the United States and applied for, in Mexico and applied for asylum. And just, I'm in Los Angeles mm -hmm. right now, but I was in New York last week. And just last week in, in New York, I saw him for the first time in the United States. So it's sort of telling that whole story of how this person who I met six years ago in Cuba uh, went on this whole worldwide journey and 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 ended up here in the United States. And it, it's it, even though it's a personal story, it's also a story about America, and immigration, and why people want to come here, and and all the other things that are going. Stay tuned for more writing black. The Grio Black Podcast Network is here, and it's everything you've been waiting for. News, talk, entertainment, sports, and today's issues, all from the black perspective. Ready for real talk and black culture amplified? Be inspired. Listen to new and established voices now on the Grio Black Podcast Network. Listen today on the Grio mobile app and tune in everywhere great podcasts are heard. Welcome back to Writing Black, y'all. I'm just going to be honest. Like, for me, um, you know, obviously, we were born here. And um, whatever that means to be black in America, and we know that that's incredibly loaded, and that it's very dependent on class and, you know, socioeconomic mobility, et cetera, um, in terms of your experience here, um, it, it does astound me sometimes. I'm like, oh, you still want to come here? <laughs> you know, like, um, and that is, I think that's a really important conversation to have, especially given what we saw, um, or I would even say saw magnified in the last administration here in America in terms of how, it, like, it so deeply magnified the immigration issue and how uh, immigrants uh, and those seeking asylum are treated, how their children are treated, um, and what one can hope to look for here in this supposed, you know, American dream. Well, but, but, you know, part of that my issue is that we forget sometimes just how privileged we are, even though things right. are, are incredibly outrageous right now in our country. We forget just how privileged we are in so many respects. I mean, I remember when I met this guy in Cuba, I had no idea what his socioeconomic status was. It was, I think, only in my second or third trip to Havana when I, went, when I finally went to his house and met his mom and his family. And I discovered he was dirt poor. I mean, dirt poor meaning like there was no bathroom door. There was no bathroom toilet seat. There was no running water. Um, you know, the leaf, the roof, roof was leaking. Um, it, it, I, I, I couldn't believe it. Like I, and you know, the average Cuban, the average income for Cubans um, at that time was something, this was only a few years ago, something like 25 to $30 a month. So, um, yeah, 
so here I come in this American spending, staying in these fancy hotels and spending hundreds of dollars on mm. meals and stuff like that. And it's a whole, it's a whole different world of privilege that we come from. So yes, I can see why somebody would want to leave that world and come here, even despite all the challenges that we have in this country. Um, so it, it, was a, it was a learning experience for me I mean, as I well. think it's a learning experience we should all have because I think that that's, uh, I mean, you're right. <laughs> you know, I know I'm incredibly privileged. Um, even while I'm not amongst the most privileged in this country, I, I do acknowledge that. But I do think that that contrast that you're discussing, no, I don't always think about that. I don't think most people think about that. Uh, does that mean I'm sitting around being totally grateful for the way that like America treats its marginalized people? No, no absolutely right. not. Um, you're also an academic. You you are an educator <laughs> also at this point. Um, can we talk a little bit about that? Because I think like, you know, um, yes, there is writing, there is craft of writing, there's craft of communicating the story. And then there's craft of sharing the story and helping other people to share theirs. So what is that experience like like for you? Like what what are you teaching and, and, and how are you teaching it? Well, you know, I'm glad you said that, but, you know, I'm glad you used those two terms, academic and educator, because I don't know that I fit in as an academic. I think I do fit in as an educator. I don't really sort of use sort of the academic lingo and jargon that so many other academics use. Um, I, I find that to be okay. off-putting in some ways, and I understand the utility of it for some people, but for me, I like my writing to be accessible. Uh, so instead of writing in word with words that I think are commonly used in the academy. I'm more interested in using words that will resonate with the with the ordinary reader. Um, and hopefully, the reader will be intelligent still, but but not necessarily needing to be familiar with all the latest mm -hmm. jingo and and jargon, mm -hmm. lingo and jargon. I'm sorry, sorry. Um, and um, so yeah, that's been always that's always been a challenge for me, sort of. Finding my way. This is why I said I, I say it all the time. I never fit in wherever I am. People always think, assume I fit in because I have all these experiences. Oh, I went to the Ivy League schools. I went to Harvard. I worked at CNN. I worked in the White House. Oh, he, he, I never fit in any of those places. I always felt like I was an outsider in all of those places. Um, and even in academia, I feel like I'm an outsider because I don't really come from that academic background. So the most recent course I've taught is a course on race and media. This is probably a, a perfect illustration of what I'm talking about. So I enjoyed the course. It started, it's a course at City College in New York. It started in February and ended in May. And it, it, required, me, it required me to go back and forth between here in Los Angeles to New York every other week because it was a hybrid course, half in person, half virtual, which at first when I signed up for, I was like, oh, yeah, this is going to be great. I'll get to go back to New York whenever I want. Oh, that was the <laughs> dumbest thing I ever did. It wore me out. It just mm -hmm. took so much energy going back and forth. I didn't have the de desire to even teach once I got there. It's just the stress of going back and five and six hours in the plane, all that stuff every other week. It, wear, it wears you out. So I would never, ever do that again. But the course itself was an interesting course. You know, I wanted to talk about race and media and racial bias and, and all that. And we spent the first half of the course doing that. And it was so, there were so many examples of things to talk about, politics and media, uh, sports, and just so many examples of bias that we were seeing uh, and, and analyzing. Uh, and of course, pop culture and um, TV and film as well. But finally, it got to the point for me where I was like, I'm tired of teaching this course. Probably shouldn't say that, but I was tired of teaching the course halfway through. Um, and I, I wanted to make the course more interesting for me and for the students in a way that was reflective of, I think, where I, where my interests are right now. So we changed the second half of the course, we changed the syllabus. So I asked the students to work on creating a, a screenplay. Um, so we spent the second half of the class, basically as a joint project, writing a 30 minute comedy screenplay uh, for, uh, it had to be a racially inclusive comedy screenplay. Uh, and they came up with this amazing idea. I was like, who are you, Norman I, Lear? I don't know how they okay. did this. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but I mean, it, they came up with a great idea. I was, instead of just critiquing the media, I was like, let's create something. That was the concept behind it. And um, I showed them how to, how to do a screenplay, because mm -hmm. that's what I'm working on now. I'm working on TV and film projects out here in LA. And gave them whole instructions on how to do it step by step. And they came up with this amazing idea. It was like a 1970s comedy, skit, comedy show. Uh, a sitcom 
uh, involving a multiracial LGBTQI group of, of friends who were living in the same house uh, in New York City. Um, and I don't know how they came up with that idea and, and why they chose to set in the 1970s. And I was thinking, this is unusual. These are, these are mm -hmm. young kids, like 20, 19, 20 year olds. And this is what they came up with. But it was a really fascinating project to watch them develop it. Stay tuned for more Writing Black. Witty, honest, entertaining. Introducing Dear Culture with Panama Jackson on the Grio Black Podcast Network. Listen today on the Grio mobile app for all the black culture debates you don't want to miss. Also available wherever great podcasts are heard. Welcome back to Writing Black, y'all. And uh, I really liked what they came I, up with. I loved how you just suddenly slipped in that you're working on a screen, you know, that you're screenwriting now. Like, I was like, I'm like, Dude, we're in a writing podcast. How do you not? How do you just like slip that in? Like, oh, yeah, and then, you know. <laughs> well, that's the reason why. That's one of the reasons why I moved to LA. I'm working on like four different. Um, speaking, of, I always got a lot of things going on. I'm working on four different um, TV and film projects. Um, one is a one-hour drama scripted series. I'm working on with my producing partner here, Jarrett Hill, um, which involves. I won't say too much, but it's it's tentatively titled Ambition, and it involves uh, somebody who runs for office. I'll just say that um, in New York. the 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 second is a um, uh, a, com a a comedy series, um, and this is about um, polyamorous relationships. Put it that way. Um, the third is a uh, document document uh, a documentary uh, film about. Um, a uh, how should I say it? A sports legend. Um, this is this is one that we're already in development. We're shooting that one already. A uh, sports legend. Um, and the fourth is a a, a docu series and a limited docu series. Um, I'm trying to describe these without telling too much, you know. So not because I haven't told anybody about what they are. No, that's why there's a little ambiguity in my in my voice, but. But the fourth is it's it's about various candidates running for office. Let's uh, listen, you know, and and this is exactly why I wanted you. Oh, oh, oh and I have more? another one. Yeah, okay, come on, give it. Well, this is one. This is, I probably should say this because I haven't. This is one I haven't developed at all. But I just came up with this idea like two weeks ago, and I probably should tell you offline. But I think it's a it's a comedy that I'm really really excited about, and I kind of like wanted to stop everything else and work on this one. But but I know I have so much else to do. But um, yeah, it's um, it's very relevant to what's going on in our country, but uh, but yeah. Okay, you I, tell, tell me, you and if you need a co-writer, you let me know. Yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, but this is exactly why I wanted you on the podcast because you know I think that a lot of times we go like writers, especially we think there's only one way to do something, there's only one medium, there's only one vehicle, and you more than anybody I know, you know that ability to kind of like pivot and evolve and explore and you know. Um, whether it's different genres or topics or what have you, like, I just think like, that's what it's about, right? Like you're a writer and we write, that's what we do. Stay tuned for more Writing Black. The Grio Black Podcast Network is here and it's everything you've been waiting for. News, talk, entertainment, sports, and today's issues, all from the black perspective. Ready for real talk and black culture amplified? Be inspired. Listen to new and established voices now on the Grio Black Podcast Network. Listen today on the Grio mobile app and tune in everywhere great podcasts are heard. Welcome back to Writing Black, y'all. I, I just really appreciate this conversation. Now, I have to ask you, since you have been educating people, um, is there a recommended reading that you would give to people who are aspiring to, to write or to explore different genres or even just to kind of open their minds to like what they could be writing about? Like, What books do you gravitate towards when you, when you think about what inspired you to write? That's a good question. I feel like it's a couple of questions Probably. in there. And one. And, um, <laughs> I don't. I, I can't think of any sort of how-to books per se on how to write. But uh, there are a lot of books that have influenced me as a writer. Um, I, I I don't even know where to begin. But one of the one of the most influential was the autobiography of Malcolm X by Alex Haley, or as told by Alex Haley. Um, and I remember reading that a long, long time ago, and, and 
I think I was in college or no before high school, um, and being influenced not just by the storytelling but by the the person who whose story was being told, um, and and so I I think I always was sort of drawn to nonfiction books you know for a long time. Um, I'm I'm only recently in my life starting to to, to embrace fiction more and i wish i had done that when i was younger because i'd probably be reading more fiction now than i than i am but my, my two favorite novels i'd say um one is alice walker's the color purple which strangely enough i read in college <laughs> and i didn't like i read it in college and i was like oh, i can't stand this and I, partly because i didn't like the the language in which it was told and also because i wasn't a fiction meanwhile i, I chose my college because uh, alice walker went there man <laughs> And, I, and yeah, I, I didn't like it when I first read it. And then I read it years later, many years later as an adult. And it just completely resonated with me in a way that it did not when I was in college. And and I was like, wow, how did I not appreciate this? And I, you know, because you can only, like I said before, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Um, and the second book is a more recent book um, yes. called The Prophets. <laughs> Uh, which I think I may have talked about. Yeah, exactly. Listen. I love that book. Um, yes. Yeah. I, 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 I may John have it Jean, right here. Oh, you have it right there. Exactly. <laughs> We've spoken to Robert from the podcast. Robert's, Robert's one of my favorite writers. That it's an amazing, amazing book. Yes. <laughs> that's an amazing, amazing book. And, and part of the reason why I resonated with it too, I have to admit in my own bias, is that Years ago in the 90s, I tried to write a novel, my first novel, and it took place in Columbus, Georgia, in, uh, in, in antebellum Columbus, Georgia, and it was about two black men who were enslaved. Um, and I never finished it. I don't think, I, because I said I was never a, 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 a fiction reader, I don't think I had the skill set at that time to be able to develop in the way I would want to. And reading um, The Prophets made me uh, appreciate that someone had taken an idea that was only just a small uh, concept in my head, even though I developed it a lot, but, and, and gone an entirely different direction and, and done justice to it in the way that I never could have. So I'm so glad that that book yeah. is in existence. It's an amazing, Absolutely. amazing piece of literature. Absolutely. Um, but then, you know, there's a lot of nonfiction books that I read all the time. I mean, I read everything from uh, spirituality books to uh, political books to books about race uh, so I'm all over the map on, on the nonfiction and biographies as well so I'm all over the map on nonfiction books I find that if I read a biography I have to do audiobooks like I did uh, Barack Obama's biography and I I'm read glad. the audio, that's a big, that's the a audio book that's, that's... <laughs> you yeah I listen I hope you listen to it on the plane day. on those you know <laughs> cross country flights <laughs> Because it's such a long, and you know, he even makes fun of himself in the book. He talks about how Michelle and his daughters would always tell him that he speaks so slowly <laughs> that, that they have to turn up the, turn up the speed when they so listen so to him on the audio book. And that's only part one, so, so, so <laughs> that's part one. We're going to get more. Uh, Keith, you know, right. listen, obviously, personally, I love you, but um, professionally, I'm inspired by you, and I'm so glad that you are in my ether, let alone my family. So thank you so much for joining us on Writing Black, especially as this is a new podcast for, Brio, for the Rio. And it's such a blessing to have you here and to, you know, you're always so fun and so candid. So I'm sure this won't be the last time. And I know I will be getting these two new books. So I'm, I, well, four new books. <laughs> so, you know, you will keep me posted and yeah. we, will, we will keep our audience posted. But thank you so much for being here. Love you, love you, love you. I see. I'm not going to say it to all Thank my, you, all my uh, writers on the side. Love you, love you, love you. <laughs> but I do. <laughs> I love you too. Right. Guys. Thank you so much. Thanks for Thank having me on the show. Appreciate, appreciate you too. it. All right, we're going to take a pause, but stay tuned for more writing black. Witty, honest, entertaining. Introducing Dear Culture with Panama Jackson on the Grio Black Podcast Network. Listen today on the Grio Mobile app for all the Black culture debates you don't want to miss. Also available wherever great podcasts are heard. All right, let's dig back into it. Welcome back to Writing Black. So obviously, it was such a treat to have my cousin Keith on the show, and now it's time for my favorites, where I recommend to you 
books that are related to the content that we have discussed. Um, you know, Keith, uh, aside from being my cousin, he's uh, obviously been a, a political pundit for a very long time. And his new book, which we did discuss on the podcast, is finally coming to people um, as a digital release, Quitting. And I can't think of a better book for this moment than quitting <laughs> you know whether we're talking about you know you're not gonna let them break your soul no more or uh you know just the great resignation this is a phenomenal time to kind of reevaluate um our lives and and what we really want out of life i think if the last few years has taught us anything is that life is incredibly precious it's been a reminder that life is incredibly precious and that we all need to to make our time here as meaningful and fulfilling as possible. So I highly recommend quitting to you by my cousin and friend, Keith Boykin. But I also recommend this book. You know this face, y'all. Tabitha Brown, um, Feeding the Soul, Finding Our Way to Joy, Love, and Freedom. So you see there's a theme here. Let's get free. Let's get free in the new year. Holidays are coming. Let's let it all go. Let's dance it off to renaissance and then, like, come hard in the new year. New year, new you. New stuff, new time, maybe a new job. I don't know. But feed your soul. <laughs> and we'll see you next time on Writing Black. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of Writing Black. As always, you can find us on the Grio app or wherever you find your podcasts. You're watching the Blackest Questions podcast with Christina Greer. In this podcast, we ask our guests, five of the blackest questions so we can learn a little bit more about them and have some fun while we're doing it. Okay, so this is a trick question. We're also going to learn a lot about black history, past and present. Beautiful. I learned a wonderful fact today. Great. So here's how it works. We have five rounds of questions about us, black history, the whole diaspora, current events, you name it. With each round, the questions get a little tougher. Oh, you got me. You got me. Uh, let me see. Let me see. Let me see. I have no idea. I knew you were going to go there, Dr. Greer. Subscribe to the show wherever you listen to your podcast and share it with everyone you know. The Griot Black Podcast Network is here, and it's everything you've been waiting for. News, talk, entertainment, sports, and today's issues, all from the black perspective. Ready for real talk and black culture amplified? Be inspired. Listen to new and established voices now on the Grio Black Podcast Network. Listen today on the Grio mobile app and tune in everywhere great podcasts are heard. 